In this video, we are looking at Red Leaves by William Faulkner, argued to be one of his greatest short stories, including by some critics to be up there with his novels. Let's talk about culture clashing and corruption in this piece, coming up. Alright, welcome to the Codex Cantina. I am Una. And I am student number one. If you'd like to go over more William Faulkner and other literary classics, please consider subscribing. And you are on your way for your Faulkner digital Faulkner certificate, which means absolutely nothing. No, it means that I'm a good student. Mm -hmm. and I got my little participation trophy. <laughs> so this was written in 1930, but many people argue it may have been written earlier in 1929 was when the market crash happened. Faulkner needed that money. So this was his play at trying to get people to see more into the Indian lives, yet he knew almost nothing about Indians and horribly represented them in this piece. But in his defense, he does use it with a literary technique, but it is something we need to talk about. Do it. So let's reorganize this chronologically, okay? So let's list out kind of the facts and break them down. Now, as we do this, we don't know the exact dates. Like, he doesn't give us dates on everything, right? So some of these might be kind of swip-swapped, but in general, this is order of how it happened in-universe of how it's written. Because what this is, is this goes through three generations. And what you're going to see is kind of what the impact is of these cultures clashing throughout throughout these generations. And I think it's kind of interesting the more you think about it. And it's it's not apparent at first, I don't think. I think that the timeline thing is something important too to, to lay out because I also think this is somewhat, I don't get into it too much, is the sins of your father. So yeah. speaking of the fathers, Doom's uncle and cousin suddenly die. <laughs> yeah. So that way, Doom, and, and I, I may horribly mispronounce these, but it's like the Ike Motube. I'm just going to call him Ike from here on Let's out. Let's call him Ike. 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 So he becomes the man, arguably through, through murder, is the general idea. This is written about more in his short story called A Justice that we plan to cover, but we're not covering it here today. We are doing Red Leaves today. So you get an implication that, that they were kind of murdered for him to take power. Yeah. Now, the man is the title for the chief, correct? Whoever is the current chief. Chief, okay. I just make sure we put that out there for viewers because that is a little bit confusing as well because it's kind of thrown in there and you think, well, are they going to be like, hey, man, like, dude, or bro? <laughs> but it's actually a title because if you read it, it's capitalized. All right, Crypto, you ready for question one on your certificate? I'm going to give you a little sneak peek. Oh, uh, yes. And what other work did Ike Motube Ike be represented. The Reavers. He might have been. I'm not sure, actually. But uh, <laughs> I'd have to double check that. But did you know uh, that, if you remember, he was also the land, the original yes. Native American that owned the land in the Bear, on the hunting grounds yes. in Yoctopatawtha County. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. So let's take that for a second. Sam Fathers died when he was, I think, 60 or 70, right? Yeah. So if we go back when basically Moke's generation was around, okay, since the bear took place 1883, if we subtract 40 years from, you know, Sam being 60 to 20, okay, that puts this Moke's timeline at roughly 1843, okay. okay? So I don't know the exact timelines, but if we do about 20 or 30 years for these two, because, again, Faulkner likes to play with time a little bit. I wouldn't say it's completely scientific, but we're looking at Doom's timeline being about 1793, when this is happening, okay? So this is all pre-abolition. This is slavery is legal at this point in time in southern United States. Okay. Well, that helps clear up everything like mud. <laughs> Tell you, we're going to come back to it, though. I, and and, and yeah. I think there's there's a reason why I bring up those dates. No, it's important. It's important. I was just teasing. Okay, so at some point in his life, Doom starts to introduce slavery to his Native American tribe. Okay? Why is that important, Crypto? Well, I guess it's because the Native Americans actually didn't believe, uh, North American Native Americans didn't believe in slavery before the introduction of slavery by Europeans. Yeah, it was, they didn't believe in a lot of property ownership, right? Yeah. Which is, which... Yeah, they didn't, they didn't understand that. That concept was very unique, where everything was more tribal. Now, with that said, because everything being tribal there were a lot of different ways to do things. And there were some tribes that actually practiced slavery. And that is what Faulkner is, with no research, trying to represent here. But most of them are, are Central America, South America, that have the 
more uh, slavery-esque. It's not slavery like the institution in Southern America in the, the 17th, 18th centuries. But to the point of this story specifically, what they're getting is a culture corruption, right? Yes. They are being burdened as they do as the white men do as, as they quoted in this story. No, they're, they're following the, that, that same path. And that's where the introduction of ownership changes in their culture because of how they're trying to emulate the the white man. And they don't want to, sort of. I mean, he, he in the story, he's trying to say, like, they don't want to do this, uh, but they feel like it's a necessity. And right. that's a, a lot of things that happens in their culture. They don't want to do these things, but it becomes a necessity for them to try to survive. It becomes a corruption of the old way, as we, we hear later on. But... Yeah. When they bring introduce the slavery, they got to find things for them to do according to this story. I actually thought it was kind of funny that 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 that, that happens. So in the story, the Native Americans are like, "We own all these people, but we're so self sufficient and we're not lazy like the white man. What do we do with these people? <laughs> like we don't have anything for them to do, and so they just like come up with jobs, and that is something that is." really misrepresented and, i think and actually i don't even know if misrepresented is correct but i'm also gonna say misrepresented and exaggerated he is specifically exaggerating this point to the point of i don't think he meant it to be funny yeah exaggerated mis exaggerated or however you would say it would that would be the the, the the better term i like that yeah so so let's come back to that we're this is one of the themes that we're going to keep coming back to so doom mates with a west indian woman while in new orleans at some point, she has some black heritage in her blood, is what they really say. And yeah. they have the son, Issei Tibeha. I'm just going to call him Issei from here on out, okay? Issei. I, I could be totally butchering that name. Now, the chief's name is Doom, which is kind of suggestive to me of of what's happening here, right? Like, Doom is kind of a, a theme to the story, too. Yeah, I think, like we've seen before, the, new, the name suggests that, like, the downfall happens when he's on watch so he's the man the chieftain or whatever and doom is upon them uh not as a proper noun but as an adjective here so doom dies 19 years after his son is born the, the issei character we just talked about so doom's son issei becomes chief at 19 and it's worth noting that since his mother had some black heritage in her he is part black, which again, I think is kind of an exaggeration here because in the white culture, that would be an issue. Like to most Southerners, like they would view you not as white. But here in the Indian culture, he's able to still become an Indian chief. Yeah, and this is actually kind of based on uh, true stories, I think a little bit. Um, so he, maybe he did some research here, but there are instances of uh, a few chieftains that, uh, especially in the Cherokee Nation, which is part of my family's Cherokee, there were some tribesmen and eventually chieftains that were part white, part Native American. So it was a lot more accepted in Native American cultures to be of mixed races. So two years later, he has his son Moke Tube. Well, I'm just going to call Moke from here on out. <laughs> so Moke inherits also part of this black heritage, right? Yes. Yet he can also be chief to your point that you were just saying. So Issei travels like his father and returns with various artifacts, and he brings back things, one of them being red slippers. Now, the things you'll notice that he brings back are completely useless to the Native American tribe, right? Like, these are all oh, things yeah. of, of white culture, American culture, European culture. These are things that are representing a perversion of these are things you don't need. Now you have to find something to do with it, much like how they greatly exaggerated kind of the slave labor earlier of we have to find things to do with these people because eventually we want to trade them right that's what they said they trade them for horses with the white men that's yeah. why they kind of bring up these artifact and compare them really awkwardly to slaves i feel like in terms of, of how he structured this but i think that's what he's going for yeah i think that's a little bit harsh the way he does it yeah but i don't think it's meant to be in like a degrading way uh if i was to say this he's trying to what we would call uh, say that that Mocha and Issa have first world problems, right? I think I think that's what he's trying, <laughs> right? I think that's what he's trying to convey. That's what it kind of came off to me. I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, but it it did rub me the wrong way a lot of, through this. No, of course. I mean, 
the whole piece is going to make you feel uncomfortable because you have a conscience and a soul. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So as Moke grows older, we have some themes of corruption being filled here. So with his foot not being able to fit into the shoe, I think that's a commentary kind of on how these cultures don't fit together. And you'll see that Moke is going through changes. He's becoming a little bit of a bigger man, a little lazier, a little less personality filled, if you will. Yeah. So again, another thing that I felt kind of humorous, but I know I probably wasn't supposed to laugh out, is that the shoe didn't even fit him when he was a baby, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's So like he was a fat little baby, <laughs> and he turns out to be like this obese man, right? Traditionally, Native Americans are not known for that, right? So here, yeah. that's part of the corruption theme. But I love, it took me so long to figure this out. The damn steamboat. Well, at one point, they take an old steamboat via slave labor, transport it back up and use that as kind of like their home base house type oh, situation. okay. Yeah, and they kept saying that leaned on the steamboat or leaned on the side, right? Yeah, do you know what that is? I'm guessing it's a, like, houseboat? Here's a quote from William Faulkner himself, which is a really unreliable source. <laughs> if you know anything <laughs> about him. But he says, The steamboat simply got too far up the river and stayed too long. And when the water fell in the late summer, it couldn't get out again. And so the owners of it just took the valuable machinery out and left the hole there. And Doom decided that would make a nice addition to his house. And so he had his people drag it out of the river across to the plantation. So I took this two ways in terms of cultural influence. And it took me a while to get here. But one is once again, we have an example of them taking ownership of physical items, which they're not known for. Right. Yeah. And they're also taking physical items of a culture that doesn't belong to them. Okay. The other is that this is very symbolic, I think, too, because they said the owners took the valuable parts and left the empty hole, the husk, behind. Mm. And I think we've seen several lines where they've talked about what has slavery brought to the Native American tribal culture, where they talk about, well, now... We just sit around and look for things for our slaves to do. And now look what Moke's become. He's this fat, non-interesting leader, the man, allegedly. But he's like this empty husk of what his culture used to represent and what his culture has become because of these foreign artifacts. And that's something that they want now, too. Yeah. Beautiful. And I it took it. You got to really dig into it, and then you find it, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's deep. I like that. Good job, man. That's nice. All right, so during this time, Issei acquires the unnamed black servant. Again, uh, not sure exactly when all these things happen, but around this time, uh, Issei acquires his unnamed black servant, who will eventually be the main character of the story, who we have yet to get to. Again, yeah. time jump. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit hard to follow. So the slave was 14, after Moke's birth, okay? Just in terms of trying to, to track down the timelines of all of this. Um, and again, obviously, the reason this happens is, oh, now we had ownership of property with the slippers, with the steamboat and all that. Now we're talking about ownership of people. So again, introducing this foreign ownership concept to a culture that hasn't traditionally had these concepts. Perversion of cultures. All right, so now the actual intro to the story. <laughs> <laughs> Issei is dying at the age of 51 and Moke is 30. Louis Berry says that he was not old, which kind of implies that he may have been murdered. I think this goes back to what you said one of your main takeaways earlier was. Yeah, this, the sins of the father. It's come back to play on him again. In the same way that Doom killed, you know, his his uncle and cousin. You see now Moke now. being killed maybe by... Okay. And they, they enter in and start talking about some very strange things like cannibalism, which I believe was a big racial stereotype of the Native Americans, which I think was mostly completely, in most cases, untrue. Um, I have seen some research where there have been times when in times of dire need, like maybe one tribe may have resorted to cannibalism, but this was not a thing. Like this was a stereotype that, that Native Americans practice cannibalism. It was not an ongoing practice with the history that we know. Is that is that fair, Crypto? Yeah, so I think this is something that is taken out of, blown out of proportion again, 
where there are a select few uh, tribes in South America that were known for, uh, you know, sacrificing humans. And there were ideals of, you know, eating the heart to gain one's power. And that led to this idea that, you know, all Native Americans were savages and that they ate their dead, they ate their, you know, kills, they ate their, you know, enemies um, to absorb their powers and stuff. And that just simply wasn't true. And speaking of more stuff like that, and I think this is why I think I have some issues with that. So Three Basket and Louis Berry are kind of talking. And I guess what's happening is they are looking for Issei's manservant, the one that he got at the age of 14. They did have burial procedures in the various, again, there's lots of tribes, lots of different ways that they did it, but they didn't always bury other people or slaves with them. Very rarely, like there are instances where they did bury dogs and and horses with them. The idea is that you were burying your ancestors with the tools that they needed to reach, I'm going to say the afterlife, but their view of afterlife wasn't the same as what you'd think from a traditional like Judeo-Christian view of things. Um, so again, this is maybe slightly exaggerated. There are some instances where this did happen, but it wasn't like a common thing. Yeah, I think I think he's mixing uh, Egyptology here and Middle Eastern cultures, and maybe a little bit of African cultures, and blending it in here because it does make an interesting story. You know, can that and we really haven't kind of said what the whole plot of the story is. Is that he dies, and they're trying to find the the slave boy to bury with him. The slave boy ain't dead. <laughs> right yeah that's pretty harsh right and, and that's... <laughs> so they're gonna kill this young slave boy to bury him in the ground with his master like that's messed up <laughs> and they said that they've done this before right they said they did this with yeah. doom and it was a three-day chase so now three basket and louis barrier in the situation where they feel burdened to chase down the property of their Indian chief so that he could have a proper burial according to their traditions. Yeah, they seem put out. Like, these two guys are, like, the worst Scarchy and Hutch ever. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so they kind of have a talk, and you see Three Berry kind of represents, or Three Basket represent, um, well, this is the way things were, even though he wasn't alive, to know what things really were like. And you have Louis Berry kind of representing, well, these are the way things are, ought to be. Kind of some loose commentary there, not terribly interesting, but they chase down this slave. And what's interesting is you do get the slave's perspective in this perspective, the unnamed slave, where you see him kind of staying near, not not tr- crazy trying to escape. Like he watches the burial, interestingly enough, but he does have a will to live. Yeah. So finally they're like, dude, Moke, the man you need to help with this chase. And here's my here's my second certificate question for you, Mr. Crypto. I'm nervous. What is the real name or the the white culture name of had two fathers who helps take off the slippers from Moke? I have no clue. I'm see, you're gonna fail my test. Moses. Crypto. Dude, this is Sam Fathers. Oh, it is? That's Sam. Wow, okay. So let's go back to dating this. I'm guessing he's 20 at this time. 40 years from now is when, 40 or 50 years from now is when he dies in 1883, I think it was, in The Bear. Okay, so this puts it at 1843? Yes, so now you see why we realize that we think this is basically confirmed 100% slavery is legalized in, in the area at this point in time. Yeah, okay. So that's Sam, dude. I like how that I like how that's webbed together. That's that's you know you always say that people get mad at Faulkner for his timelines and stuff, but that's pretty intricate. That's pretty deep. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where we go a step deeper into the books that we read. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so here's what. Here, okay, they track him down. He he hides with his slaves. That that part's not all that literary interesting. He goes to the swamp, and what happens in the swamp, Mister Crypto? They find him. They find him. How long is, how long has this chase gone on for? Three days. Six days. Oh, is it six days? Just like Genesis, where they worked for six days, and on the seventh day they rested. Oh, okay. What happened when he was in the swamp? I'm totally going to fail my test. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> wow, crypto. I just read it today, too. Oh, the snake. He gets bitten three times by that snake. They kind of capture him. He's now weakened. The snake 
is introducing venom, a foreign substance, into his body, which weakens him. In the same way that we've seen the objects pollute their, their desires, their needs, the slaves pollute their, their way of life, the venom is polluting the runaway unnamed slave with its venom, with how he's traditionally been very good at escaping, all of a sudden now he's caught because of he's been corrupted. Corrupted. Okay. That's good. I like that. Yeah. Like the story is not very clear, but once you really sit down and study it, this actually is a solid work. Okay, so they bring him back, and he wants an axe to cut off his his arm, <laughs> even though he's about to be killed for this burial some I, ceremony. He's about to cut off his dang arm. I was a little bit confused on the purpose of. I got the you. Arm. I got you. Okay. His arm has been corrupted by the venom. The Native Americans at this point in time were con- corrupted by European and American Southern culture. They didn't have the strength to cut off the corruption before their cultures became impacted. What okay. he's saying is the slave has the strength. Even though he's dying, he's got this will to survive. He has the strength to cut off the arm to prevent the corruption to his body. I feel like he's blending another culture in here of like Asian belief system, you know, of cutting your nose off to spite your face. <laughs> I feel like he's blending a lot of different stuff in this. He's like taking every terrible stereotype there is and putting him in one story. Well, and he's known for not doing a ton of research in history. I know that's a sin to you, the the history yeah. teacher. But I think that is what makes the story not super compelling. I get that they're meant to be exaggerations. I get that Moke and his fatness and his lack of personality is meant to exaggerate what the cultures become. Um, I get that, but it still just rubs me the wrong way that like the characters are described. It's rough. Um, and I think also what's hard too is that you and I can go a step deeper and pull these pieces out, right? This story and the idea of power and corruption are told via these surrogates, right? That you see kind of like... Um, which are going to make you feel uncomfortable, and then you might not get the right message out of it, which is unfortunate because it's an awesome story, and I, I like how he's web... I like how he's made this you know intricate web of this story. It's a really ambitious short story. Like, this is three generations... The idea of cultures corrupting each other, i this is incredibly ambitious for how short the story is. And including Christianity and, yeah, uh, you know, and including it in all of his other pieces. And no, it, it definitely is. Uh, is it on piece. par with his novels? I, I'm not there. I really don't agree with that statement at all. Um, Go Down Moses is this, where you're talking about lineage and how through time, you know, your choices impact future generations. Go down Moses and, and Absalom, Absalom, do it way better in my view. But with that said, this is an incredible piece that via surrogates of institutional, you know, slavery being represented through how um, the steamboat was kind of passed on into the culture about the moccasins kind of being this power corrupts thing, the snake and the can you cut off something before it harms you sort of thing. Really brilliant. It really is. Um, now, what it, well, what do you think about... Can we go to the end of the story? Yeah. Okay, so at the end, uh, they basically going to kill him, and they take him to the well, right, to give him kind of his last rites. Mm-hmm. And he asks for the gourd, and he, like, won't stop drinking from it. What do you think that symbolizes? Like, I mean, people out there might have different interpretations. Maybe I took the simple route. But you'll notice in so many of these stories, there is this will to survive in Faulkner's main characters. Even when they lose, they want to survive. They want to continue on. That's the most important part. And I think that's what he was going for there. Yeah, if I just if I don't stop drinking, they won't take me away and they won't kill me. It's the will to survive, the will to feed the body, to nourish the soul. Yeah. You see it in and a it, lot of Faulkner works. Yeah, and it, it's, it's kind of... I mean, the whole peace is depressing sort of and you're angry at it for other reasons besides you know the the main character is basically going to die needlessly 
according to our point of view and our belief system. But right, right. Uh, at the end, uh, Three Basket is the one with him there, right? And he's just like, all right, you're done. Grabs the gourd, hangs it back up, and like, we're going to go kill you now. <laughs> like, so nonchalant. Like, and it's, just, it's, it's, it's almost heartless. And I think that that does show of how corrupted they are and how they've become so much like the white man that these people were treated so terribly. Because in the beginning of the story, they're like, these are like people like everybody else. And by the end, they're like, they like to sweat and they're not like us and they're terrible mm-hmm. and they're this and they're that. And you're like, oh, it's well, it, 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 you and I saw, I mean, it's fiction, right? But you yeah. and I saw the humanized view of him trying to survive. They see property that has inconvenienced them to have to chase for seven days before <laughs> they can finally rest. Well, six days and then finally rest just like Genesis, right? Yeah. From the Garden of Eden, they've plucked their fruit. All right, Mr. Crypto, let's go to ratings. I feel like, just to get it out, short and simple, I, I really like this story. Incredibly ambitious, but I think some of the lack of research and racist aspects of it, I'm not saying he was racist, but I'm saying that things were prevent, presented in a very racist way. Some was exaggeration. Some was just lack of knowledge. I'm going to call that racism. Uh, I'm going to go with a 7 out of 10 for this one. Yeah, that's what I was going to give it was uh, six and a half, seven. I think that's fair. I think this is a... I don't want to say poor because I'm giving it a 7 because I really enjoyed the story. Mm-hmm. But I think that it is a poor historical fiction representation right. Right. of very, very important cultures to our history of the Native Americans and African culture and European culture all blending together. Right. I, I love William Faulkner, but his decision to not research the local Indian tribes is his decision. Um, and in our wokeness, we're unfortunately going to pass whatever judgment we need to. So with that, guys, thank you for checking out today's video. Please consider subscribing for more breakdowns. We do William Faulkner and other literary fiction all the time. Una out. Peace.